back to the Primal Blueprint Podcast. I got Brad Kearns here, who is one of the original hosts of the Primal Blueprint Podcast, still does some shows. Um, he is also a New York Times bestselling author with Mark Sisson of the Keto Reset Diet and their new book, Two Meals a Day, uh, which Mark and Brad already did a, a great discussion on, and we're sort of going to continue it from here. Uh, I also, uh, Brad is my publisher. Brad is um, one of my mentors. I cannot say enough good things about Brad and all that he and Mark has taught me. He's the guy I call if I got a question I can't have answered through a Google search. Um, welcome back to your own show too. How's it going, brother? Oh my gosh, it's L. Russ, my favorite hostess with the mostest. And we are tight, as you described to the listeners. And it's been a really fun journey to work on all these primal things together for the past decade plus. And I look forward to this conversation. Like you said, uh, Mark talked through the content of the new book, Two Meals a Day, pretty nicely. So I think there's some things that we can uh, zero in on and focus on that would be really interesting to the listener. And it seems to me from the feedback and the interactions that I have with listeners to the podcast and so forth, um, dropping excess body fat is, is sort of a topic of interest to many people. It still is. Imagine that. And um, you know, we, we, we covered that uh, pretty, pretty well in the book. But it was sort of as an aside, if you do all these things, um, then you're going to, you know, have a wonderful time uh, losing weight and not struggling like you do with a regular diet. But maybe we should just get into some, you know, uh, just don't pull any punches and say, look, this is how to do it. And that might be a fun start. I know yeah. well, you're, you're going to take us on a great direction as always. Well, no, I think that's great. But before, uh, by the way, people that are listening, this is also a video, ep video episode. Um, the link is in the show notes. It'll be on YouTube under Mark's Daily Apple channel. If you're watching, but even if you're not, I'm holding up right now. Brad have made an incredible nut butter and he did not tell me to come out here and do this. I'm doing it because this stuff's amazing. It's called Macadamia Masterpiece. It's sort of like a incredible mind-blowing keto nut butter spread. Um, you guys have to check it out. It's on Amazon. I've gone through a couple of jars and it's a great unique gift to give to people. Like how tired is giving someone a candle or something random? Like this is a very unique nut butter. You can go to Amazon or bradventures.com to find out more about it. It's delicious. I'm so I'm so proud of you. And this is such a great product. Everyone who's tried it is like, oh damn, I think I I overdid it and ate it in too short a span of time. So I had to make it last more. But um, I just wanted to give a shout out for that because it's a really incredible uh, nut butter. What a nice plug. Thank you, Elle. It's been a lot of fun to come up with something in my kitchen and then uh, get it to market. Just the whole thing is is pretty wild. So I hope people enjoy it and um, well, this, this make good choices, of, right? Speaking of fat loss, this is a great, uh, I don't want to eat a dessert. I want something a little sweet because it's not too sweet, but it's sweet enough. It tastes very cookie-like, snickerdoodle-y, something. I can't even define it. It's so good. And then also it can be an in-betweener, something where you need to satiate your brain or something. You're feeling a little hunger. You're not fully hungry. You know dinner or the meal's coming soon and you just need to top it off. That's kind of how I like to use, you know, uh, nut butters and things like that. So it's a, it's a great thing to have on hand. Um, but yeah, let's talk about excess fat loss. So everyone wants that. Um, where does two meals a day? I mean, look, I kind of already eat two meals a day, but um, let's just let's just have you open it up and, and see what things might not have been covered in your discussion and uh, with some of your questions and things you get from people. What what do we need to know? How do we do this? Yeah, I think there's something really exciting going on now in our scene here in the diet and and eating and nutrition world. And there's, it's, I feel like it's a confluence of different research and different voices of people uh, hitting this theme. And the theme is that uh, our longstanding notions of uh, calories in, calories out to, to achieve a, a weight loss goal has been blown out of the water now. And it's really uh, crazy to sit back and, and realize that um, you know, the, the number of calories you eat and the number of calories you burn. In other words, if you try to eat fewer calories and go and exercise more uh, because it's January 1st and we wanna lose weight and, and meet our goals, it, it has been proven not to work. And there's some great voices. Uh, Dr. Jason Fung's The Obesity Code has numerous studies cited. Um, one of them was called the, uh, um, the, uh, the women's, uh, Nurses Women's Health Initiative study. And these women agreed to very diligently uh, reduce their calories uh, and, and exercise more. Uh, for seven years, they, the study went on for 50,000 nurses. So a very you know, uh, substantial group here. 
and they predicted that the subjects would lose, I believe it was like 23 pounds per year at this rate. If you cut back, do the math yourself. If you, if you eat two or 300 fewer calories less per day, just put that cliff bar away instead of snacking on in the afternoon, you're going to be 23 pounds lighter. Well, guess what? Uh, at the end of seven years, uh, the results were that they had lost like uh, 0.7 pounds on average across the population. So they basically didn't lose any weight despite cutting calories and exercising more. And so what's going on here? We know now from this, uh, this scientifically validated uh, thing called the compensation theory is that our body engages in assorted ways to conserve calories and be more efficient with the calories we burn if we feed ourselves less food. And if we and, exercise and, too much, same thing. Yeah, I wanna jump in there and say one of those mechanisms really is the thyroid because mm. if you are completely restricting calories on a regular basis and maybe you're not doing the right macros or eating enough fat or whatever, again, that's gonna send a little bit of a starvation signal or a signal like, hey, Brad's kind of in trouble body. So we're gonna dial back the fat burning T3 and pull it back a little bit. So what you, in what you think you can gain in a short time by knocking this out, you are actually taking steps backwards. I'm not surprised that those were the results of that study. Yeah, and Dr. Herman Ponser has a book coming out here in early 2021 called Burn, and he's noted for his uh, study of the Hadza in Tanzania, this primitive living population, and he put accelerometers on there and measured their caloric intake and has all this data, and he determined that even though these people have a tremendously active lifestyle, far more active than uh, the average modern human, uh, the men are walking uh, something like seven to nine miles a day, the women are walking three to five and, and gathering and working hard, um, there's an, there, there appears to be uh, an upper limit, a ceiling of human caloric expenditure each day. And we have this cute graphic in two meals a day where you have uh, on Saturday, the subject goes out, rides his bicycle 100 miles through the hills and has an awesome ride and then comes home. And of course, what do you do after a 100 mile ride? Uh, you I take a nap, <laughs> <laughs> you, have, you have an extra pint of Ben and Jerry's that night, you're watching TV, you're pushing the remote control and that's the rest of your day. And then you compare it to Sunday where here's a person out tending to their garden, walking their dog for a couple miles at the park, eating normal portion size sizes and normal meals. And it's a complete wash in terms of caloric expenditure and any uh, desire to you know, achieve that deficit that we think is uh, contributing to fat loss. And so we bump up against this upper limit of caloric expenditure each day, no matter what. And even if you go to the gym can, can at you, 6 a.m. Can, can you explain that a little bit further? Just give, you, give us the, the limit of caloric expenditure. I know you just did, but to like a third three-year-old, like what, how would you explain that? Like the, the limit, the ceiling? Meaning yeah. no matter how much I work out, I think right. I'm burning all this stuff, right. but I'm not really burning yeah. it. What's the well here's a good example. Let's say you wake up because you're a badass and you go to the 6 a.m. spinning class uh, this many days a week. Ugh. And the other days you go and do your uh, your weight training class. And so you're one of these extreme fitness enthusiasts in the highest score category. And everyone thinks you're awesome because you do this uh, hour of power on the bike while most people are asleep. Now, we know I used to work for spinning and we did research and we showed that a, a spinning class burns about 650 calories, uh, which is pretty awesome. It's a pretty hard workout. Yep. And um, that can make, you know, seemingly a big contribution if you have goals of, of shedding excess body fat. But let's say you burn, you divide those calories over 24 hours. It's only, uh, you know, uh, uh, 25 calories per hour or something like that extra if you spread it out. And then you take your sedentary neighbor who doesn't do much more than uh, climb the stairs one flight at their office or walk out and get the newspaper, or take the dog for a five minute walk, um, but they're less fit than you. So they're gonna burn more calories climbing the stairs, going to the grocery store, pushing their cart from the store to their car. And so they're gonna kind of catch up to this fitness queen or king who has this amazing workout regimen because what happens to the, the person that's so fit the rest of the day? is they're very calorically efficient. Subconsciously and consciously, they are a little bit slower, a little bit lazier because they push themselves so hard in the morning with this simplified example, right? So just like the guy who rode the 100 miles on Saturday, he's not gonna be good for mowing the lawn or, or hauling cement bags to the backyard to build the retaining wall that day because all the energy has been put out 
for that exercise workout. So however you like to slice it, you're going to burn a similar amount of calories no matter what your lifestyle is like. So what does that mean for us when we're trying to equate fitness pursuits with weight loss? It means it doesn't really matter much. And then the, the, uh, the, the, the cream of the crop or the, the icing on the cake here is that, um, guess what happens when you exercise really hard? you stimulate an increase in appetite. So your appetite hormones are telling you, go eat more food, as Mark Sisson says, in case this crazy fool tries to do this again tomorrow, you are triggered to contribute to eat more calories in case you need to get up the next day, which a lot of people do, and train and train again. So you have an athlete, better than sitting on the couch, right? There's all these benefits to fitness, but not really the direct association that we're gonna drop body fat from doing our Peloton ride in the morning. And so there goes all the advertising, the marketing, the promoting of the last 40 years of the fitness industry, telling you that you can have a six pack from doing these badass workouts. And so the truth is, you know, way beyond that. And then we're left with this frustrating, you know, we're shaking our head going, well, then what is the secret to dropping Yeah, so you're saying like, oh, then, then we're just saying like, oh, I just uh, walk up your stairs do some errands, move a bag of cement and eat right. And you're fine. Uh, so then we have the diet part, which is the, the, by far the biggest variable, right? And so how are we going to uh, nail this to the extent that we can, let's say, drop some excess body fat if we want to, and then be able to maintain this desired body composition for years and decades on end, even though uh, our caloric intake is going to vary and our caloric expenditure is going to vary. And so now I think, as I said, this confluence of research on the one side, we have this idea that the compensation theory negates the, um, the benefit of exercise for fat reduction. And then on the other side, we have this... Um, uh, this kind of hormone optimization theory. And, you know, you and I and Mark and this podcast and, and the books that we put out have been talking about this for a long time, that it's not about the, uh, the calories as much as uh, sending the right signals to your genes so that you're a fat burner instead of a sugar burner. And one of the things that comes up for scrutiny is this uh, propensity for snacking or, or for consuming calories in a huge eating window throughout the day. I'm sure some of the listeners are familiar with Dr. Panda's research, the time, uh, time restricted feeding uh, commentary that uh, Rhonda Patrick interviews him and they have popular YouTube videos. And he's done great work with mice down at Salk Institute, UC San Diego, where um, they fed these groups of mice the same number of calories, but one group was limited to a constrained eating window and the other mice could go and eat that food whenever they wanted. And the results were astonishingly different. So the mice that had a constrained eating window lost weight, had good metabolic health markers, and the other ones got obese and sick and all that. And so the human, you know, we're not designed to eat for most of our waking hours. And Dr. Panda has a really popular app with tens of thousands of people contributing to the data and putting in their diet things. And like the average eating window of the American is like 14 and a half hours. And it's like, wait a second, that's how long we're awake about. And so uh, if we're eating every waking moment, um, that's going to be, d regardless of the number of calories or, or you know, all of the things being equal, that's going to be uh, a strike against us when we're well, trying to be fat zone burners. Like. It's very zone-like. It's very zone-like. It's very Weight Watchers. It's very, um, you know, and, and it's funny because I, one of my family does Weight Watchers and I'll give them credit. They do lose weight, but I still don't see them satiated. I feel like they keep looking. <laughs> for, you know what I mean? I feel like it doesn't, it's not completely controlled satiation, but they do lose <laughs> some weight. But I will say that I feel like when I stayed with them, I felt like they were eating all the time. And I, and I remember being like, how are you so hungry? You ate a whole bowl of oatmeal with da da da. And now it's only 11 o'clock and you're eating a snack of whatever the hell that you're supposed to. And it just seems like, when is there ever the break other than after dinner and through sleeping, right? It just seems like it was so much. And I, uh, yeah, that can't be right. So let's, on two meals a day, I mean, listen, mostly when you go paleo or you go, uh, paleo keto, you kind of naturally go to two meals a day a bit. What are you suggesting with two meals within a certain eating window of time, max eight hours? What's the? Uh, well, the eating window should never exceed 12 hours. Okay. And not only eating, but also an interesting aside, which has tripped me up before I became aware of it, uh, is this uh, digestive function. So digestive function occurs when you consume any xenobiotic substance, anything that needs to be metabolized by the body, even if it doesn't have calories. So if you wake up at 6.30 a.m. and you, you pour your cup of coffee or your herbal tea or take some vitamin pills, that starts your clock for digestive function. 
that's actually not a bad thing because we want to uh, align the digestive circadian rhythm with our overall circadian rhythm. So if you want to get up and kind of wake up your digestive clock and that'll help you feel more alert and energized, there's research showing that's true. So go ahead, have your herbal tea, but keep in mind that your digestive clock starts when you have that non-caloric cup of coffee or tea. And so if that's at 6.30 a.m., then we wanna be mindful to stop eating any calories or asking for any digestive function after 6.30 p.m., especially after dark, because again, digestive circadian rhythm and circadian rhythm, we want those to be aligned. And the body, the digestive system is not optimized after dark. It's not meant to be digesting food. It's meant to be going to sleep soon after it gets dark. That's our ancestral experience. Right, well, and that's why, I mean, I think the rule of thumb is when you're a sumo wrestler, here's your game. You eat a huge, fatty, ridiculous meal, and then you go to bed, right? Right. You go before bed. I think that's Start their storing strategy. fat. Yeah, yep. that's their strategy. So, okay, so no more than 12 hours, last eating around 6.30, because we're talking about people that would go to bed 9, 30, 10, right? Somewhere around there. Um, if I'm having that cup of coffee in the morning, which I'm assuming you still do, yeah? Uh, I don't drink coffee. If you're watching oh. on YouTube, you can see I'm already that... I'm already a little shaky, man. I'm, I'm hot wired anyway. And actually, El, just to, as an aside, like when I was an athlete way back when on the triathlon circuit, I formed this belief that I wanted to have all unfiltered feedback about how I was feeling. Uh, and so I never took anything. Of course, I didn't uh, take any banned substances because we were tested all the time. But right. along with that, I didn't take any stimulant. I didn't take any ibuprofen. I didn't take anything that would mask pain, reduce inflammation, or stimulate the central nervous system. Because if I was tired one day, I wanted to feel the full effect of that fatigue. And I was dragging ass in the morning and I couldn't get up quickly. Of course, I was an athlete. I had the luxury of just writing these things out. But that allowed me to be make better training decisions. I, nothing against coffee. Coffee, it's very popular well, well, and it works you, for a lot of people. But two, yeah, is, is two meals a day, it would the morning cup of coffee pamper that for you, in your opinion? Or would you no, say, no, no, I mean, black coffee, enjoy yourself if that's all you're sure, that's, sure. Okay, and you know, um, Sisson gives a free pass, he puts a little cream and a pinch of sugar in his coffee, and he claims that he's fasting until 1 p.m. and he's he's Mr. Compress Eating Window. And guess what? The 30 or 40 or 50 calories that he's putting in his coffee is going to be burned so quickly that it's not going right. to stimulate insulin, it's not going to interfere with fasting goals. I mean, Dave Asprey has been pitching his bulletproof coffee for a long time and, and providing you know, detailed explanation that's of why. Yeah. Right, right. And, you know, if it's easier for someone to, to try a strategy like that, you know, I, I think one thing that we really tried hard to do in this book was to not be dogmatic, uh, not take sides and offend people from the plant-based community that make a moral decision or whatever reason they're deciding not to eat animals. We do point out that this is a very high risk diet because you're excluding so many nutritious foods, but overall, whatever you like to do and whatever your lifestyle's like, you're gonna make this work for you with personal preference being the driving factor. And so if that's a coffee with high calories in it and that's part of your game, technically that, that could be considered a Meal, but whatever works is and is a huge step of improvement from just blindly going along and succumbing to things like Weight Watchers. Uh, apologies, I mean I know they're not sponsor of our show for good reason, but um, <laughs> th these flawed and dated approaches that make people feel like failures and that they're lazy and undisciplined because they can't lose weight. This is the thing that we really need to blow the lid off now and to realize that uh, Gary Tobbs has done a great job with his book saying like, look, if you're, uh, if, if, if you're um, obese, it's not your fault. It's literally the dysregulation of your appetite hormones commanding you to eat because you're hungry all the time Absolutely. and also making you too tired to exercise and burn it off. And so when someone's too tired, I mean, I've been tired as an athlete and not feeling like working out and no amount of uh, badgering from mythical Jillian Michaels coming to my door is going to get me out the door. And if I'm hungry, guess what? All of us can raise our hand. When you're hungry, you're going to go find some food, even if it means getting in your car and drying over, driving over a snowy mountain and pass. So we have yeah. to kind of back into this challenge uh, of dropping excess body fat as we started this string of conversation. We have to back into it, realizing that it's all about uh, sending the signals to our genes, hormone optimization, making good choices like limiting that eating window to at least inside 12 hours. And as you know, a lot of people are finding um, more success or they're popularizing a 16 slash eight pattern where you're fasting routinely for 16 hours overnight and in 
into a midday and then you're eating all your calories in an eight hour window. And if I could continue with that one, the other part, I think some people are misunderstanding is like, oh yeah, I'm on a 16, eight. So come, you know, come 12 noon, I start slamming the snacks, the meals, another snack, here comes another meal, snacks afterward and go to sleep. That's not really what uh, anyone has in mind here. So the idea is that you kind of exist in this feast or famine pattern. And that seems to be the healthiest way for the human to, to live. And that's uh, aligning with our ancestral experience also, where you know when it's time to eat, we're not counting calories or weighing portion sizes or stressing about how many macros is in this meal or that meal. We're just enjoying a celebratory experience with, with our friends or our family, ha having a nice break from the, the busy workday and not worrying about the, the calories because if you cut back on calories, it doesn't work anyway. So we wanna have totally satisfying well, and rich crazy. Meals. Right, I can't sit there with a bottle of olive oil and just never let it, you know, and just let it pour all over everything every <laughs> single day, right? There's going to be a limit if I eat more, way more fat than I'm burning. Um, well, that's the thing. You're going to get full when you consume these high satiety foods, <laughs> especially protein. And so you think about the comparison between, uh, you know, binging on uh, too many slices of cheesecake or too many pints of Ben and Jerry's versus how many times have you eaten too many omelets or had too many steaks in a row? Uh, you know, the, the steak was so good at dinner, you fried up another one and then a third and then you felt terrible the next day. It's almost impossible to become <laughs> overstuffed on high nutrition, you know, nutrient dense, high satiety foods. And so right. then if your diet is in, you know, involving mainly nutrient dense, high satiety foods, you're going to, you know, find yourself automatically landing in this beautiful uh, zone where you feel great all the time. You're never hungry. You're never feeling deprived and you have these fabulous meals. And, you know, we've been talking about this for 12 years. Like this is the primal blueprint uh, going back to the time of, you know, look, look to our hunter gatherer ancestors, eat real foods. And, and most especially, and this is how the book starts. And it's like, if you can't finish chapter one, you might as well throw the thing away and, and you know, we'll, we'll part ways. Um, but you got to get rid of the junk food. And if you can get rid of that processed food, you're so far ahead of the game that you can even do these, uh, you know, strange, uh, questionable strategies like vegan, vegan vegetarianism and, and say that you feel great and, and all that, as long as you're not eating the sugar, the grains and the refined industrial seed oils yep. at, to excess. Okay, so uh, give us an example uh, of something, for example, like a day for you, two meals a day. Give us like kind of the specifics of you wake up, the fasted, you go work out, then what happens? Oh my gosh. I, yeah, I try never to use myself as mirror. an example. <laughs> <laughs> I get on, do some podcasts. Uh, we have a coaching call with L Russ. Everything's First of all, good. You're better. You work go. out. You, you, I mean, you're like a workout guru, but you, uh, you do morning, right? You're a morning workout guy. Well, I have this morning uh, flexibility, mobility, strengthening routine. I have it on YouTube and I'm, I really like discussing it because for me, it's been a life-changing thing because I'm not a super consistent guy, right? I answer to my own calling. I, I work for myself, all those things. So I don't have structure in place in my life, but I do this routine every single morning. And it's actually become... Uh, quite lengthy and quite challenging, but I tiptoed in that direction over four years. I haven't missed a day in four years now. It started as a pretty easy 12 minute routine where I'm just stretching my legs and doing uh, some flexibility things. And now like this thing takes a minimum of 35 minutes. It's quite challenging. And it kind of counts as a workout, even though it just is intended to be like my sure. morning stretches. And so uh, that's really a great uh, frame of my day to know that I, I can count on my first 35 minutes doing that instead of reaching for my phone, like 84% of Americans do. And right. then they get thrown into this reactive mindset, which is really harmful and stressful. So I, I kind of uh, tout that as uh, something that really frames my experience. Yeah, but I then with that. eating, you know, what's interesting, I don't know, you may feel uh, similar here, but you know, I've been so deep into this for so long, uh, including, you know, writing the keto reset diet with Mark back in 2017 and pricking my finger so many times I got scar tissue because I was writing down my blood numbers several times a day. And at a certain point, you realize when your diet's clean, right, when you've cut out all the nonsense junk foods, 
and bad habits like whatever, eating, standing up as you're running out the door or eating at 10 o'clock at night, all those kind of things. Uh, you're in a groove where you don't have to worry about it too much. You don't have to stress or obsess about it too much. And so it allows you to kind of put intuitive eating in the forefront rather than a regimentation or a structure. And I'm just uh, speaking freely and, and telling you about my personal experience because I know it works for a lot of people to quantify things and write sure. down and honor their journal and be accountable and weigh themselves every morning and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but, you know, going back decades now uh, as an athlete and, and, you know, living and breathing my training and write down every single workout and every time that I did for my 100 meter repeats in the pool, at mm. a certain point, you know, it can become arduous and even stressful for people that have yes. uh, some emotional concerns about uh, eating and dieting. So to answer your question the long way, um, every day is kind of different such that I don't, you know, have a template where you can expect me to, to check in with the exact same omelet every day at the exact same time. And that means some days, oh my gosh, it might be 1045 in the morning and I'll hit the dark chocolate and that'll be, <laughs> it's not a meal. I'm not supposed to snack because we talk about in the book how bad snacking is, but that might be my, my go-to thing uh, at that time of day. And then I might make a huge gigantic meal at, at 3.30 p.m. And who knows, maybe eat something later that day, but that's kind of a haphazard day. But typically, I guess you could say that um, there's a nice midday meal and then an evening meal. And that's kind of uh, a, a starting point to, uh, you know, five, to get in a good group. 11 and 5.30, what, what are your kind of general? Yeah, probably um, 12 and, and 6.30 or something. And, you know, Brian McAndrew, our main man who does all the videos and the audios What's and up, is Brian? living yeah. the dream like anybody else, like, like no one else uh, with his tremendous, too. yeah, tremendous uh, commitment to his strength training regimen and his healthy living. And you can see him on all the videos doing the home base workouts. He's done a great job with that. Uh, but he uh, advocates for what works for him is kind of uh, a morning meal and then an evening meal. So he's not doing this long 16 hour fast where he's waiting till uh, the midday, but guess what? A 16 hour overnight fast, very impressive, right? Mm -hmm. But how about being fasted for 10 hours over the course of your entire busy day? So if you eat breakfast at 8 a.m. and then have dinner at 6 p.m., boy, that's just as impressive or just as high a score for your intermittent fasting bonus points as uh, you know getting all those hours banked while you're sleeping. Because obviously it's pretty darn easy to fast while you're sleeping. And then it's pretty easy to last until noon if you're coming off uh, a sleeping period. So that morning evening pattern, and we detail these in one of the chapters of the book, like the different ways you can do two meals a day. The morning evening pattern is one that I just described. Uh, the 16-8 pattern, or you could call this the wait until when for your first meal. That means when hunger ensues naturally. So that might be waiting till 12 noon and then having a lunch and a dinner. And then finally, the intuitive strategy, which I described for myself, which is um, I don't want to be bothered by hard and fast rules. Whatever the F you feel like it. That's right. Sure. But, you know, if you, I mean, we're talking like, let's go back and look uh, 365 days later. How does my pattern look? It's going to line up pretty darn well with you know, a nice evening meal, a midday meal, uh, maybe some uh, departures here and there for whatever. Sure, sure. Uh, but I, I want to emphasize other people's dinner yeah, parties yeah. are going to start later. There's always going to be um, yeah. stuff for that. But yeah, that's, I mean, and that essentially is kind of at least the eating between 12 and 630 or 12 and eight, depending on when you go to bed, uh, is very in line with just it's intermittent fasting, right? Um, what's, what's different about this? Well, there, there's some, there's some points here that I feel like we've made a unique contribution to emphasize. And there's a lot of great work and I love the books that sure. I mentioned um, and, and more Rob Wolf's Wired to Eat is a wonderful book about these hyper palatable foods that are causing a huge problem to where, yeah, I am hungry for more ice cream because it's a hyper palatable food that the food industry designed to get me to continue to eat more and more. And so we have to throw that into the equation too, that our food choices, boy, um, this stuff is uh, really uh, hijacking the brain's dopamine pathways and compelling us to eat more and more. So we have this exercise component where it's important to uh, not overdo it and to get more basic everyday movement. We have to make the right food choices. And then we're starting to, you know, proceed toward this wonderful conclusion that, hey, it's really not that hard. And it doesn't require any pain, struggle, suffering, and sacrifice to, uh, you know, reach that body of your ideal uh, to, to some extent and 
and enjoy it and not have to sweat it out like someone who's in a regimented program like the WW we mentioned before. So well, you asked me what's different. And I think one of them is- The contributions, yeah. Yeah, we're, um, we're, we're really trying to emphasize the complementary lifestyle practices that are so important. Because I think, especially in the scene with all the podcasts and all the information and all the books available, people uh, tend to be obsessed with diet. And I've sat back and watched the keto movement grow from, you know, when we started writing the book, The Keto Reset Diet, there was virtually nothing out there about the ketogenic diet. And we had to research what the heck is this thing ourselves and learn more and talk to the experts like Dom D'Agostino and people doing the early, early research, Finney and Volek, and, and go, okay, this is really cool. This has a lot of potential. But now what you see out there on the street uh, is a, bastardize, a bastardization of the main principles of the ketogenic diet, which was originally driven by being fasted or starving and then your body makes these ketones for survival and now it's like hey here's a um you know yet another way you can enjoy a fat bomb and you know still go for this this wonderful keto thing um so we're trying to like look past all that and emphasize that look it's not just about your diet you can get fat on keto if you're not doing it right it's happened to so many people even even Terry, even people that are super fit, bodybuilding type of people, their bodies may not look totally different, but they, they it, Drew Manning, they always say like when they do it, their, their body fat still does increase. It, it does if they're doing it right. Um, there's nothing necessarily wrong with that. Um, but again, if you're eating way more than you're burning, and this happened to me when I first started paleo and I made that mistake and I've talked about it before and Mark was like, what are you, what are you, what are you doing? And I'm like, I don't know, I'm eating nuts. And he was like, stop, <laughs> you know, cause I didn't realize how many calories, how dense, how much fat he's like, Oh, you need to burn the fat off your body, not just what you're putting in there. So I think the keto thing's been bastardized too by the people that are doing it. I talked to one client who version of Bulletproof Coffee was two tablespoons of MCT and two tablespoons of butter. That's 600 motherfucking calories. That's an omelet right there. Yeah, that, that that's like, you're, you just blew your whole day on that. I mean, you know, so I think some people have misconceptions of it. And I, I think the trick is because fat is so concentrated and small and the visual doesn't make sense, right? The people are like, oh, just add a little fat to each meal, add a little, and before they know it, it's way too much because they're not gauging it right. I think that's one macro that's kind of good to look into too, to be like, wait a minute, how much am I really doing here? You know, and when you add it up, you see you might be overdoing it and that might be hampering uh, some of the fat loss, I would say. Yeah, it's interesting. I never thought about it that way where the fat doesn't make a big, it's not like a head of iceberg lettuce where you're eating this massive thing. Uh, You can just have a few tablespoons and um, that equals four heads of iceberg lettuce if you were to munch all those, right? Okay, Mm -hmm. the concentration of fat, yeah. Yeah, because when you look at the plate and you look at the deviation of things that are bigger in the mind, at least this was me too. I was like, oh, you just add, you know, just and. But if you really count it up, you're like, oh no, I went way over what I'm probably burning. And this is why I'm not getting the results that I want. And so I think people just have that misconception. Um, what are some other points along your way in your research when you're doing this? I mean, I, I I love this concept of, it seems right to me that we should be in a state of fast, well, obviously just ancestrally. Um, I know you guys have talked a lot about this in Keto Reset. I don't know if you mentioned it in two meals a day. Um, but about autophagy, could you just touch on like all of the good things that go on in our body when we are fasted and why um, the eating is sort of the relax and like chill versus the autophagy or fasting is really the repair, yeah? Oh yeah, good question. Thanks for pointing that out because it really gives one a sense of relief uh, when we're trying to optimize and figure out the best diet. And I remember when I was uh, racing triathlons and Sisson was my coach and we'd be looking into the latest, greatest supplements and eating strategies and how to get the most, you know, super powerful, nutritious foods into our body. And, you know, you go to the juice bar and you have 15 different choices of fresh squeezed juice. And would you like the ginger balm inside that wheatgrass or would you like the lemon, uh, the lemon, uh, all these wonderful acai uh, magical things? Guess what? Nothing trumps being in a fasted state for health benefits. Our immune system works best when we're fasted. 
uh, are cell repair. You call it a autophagy. That's the natural internal cellular detoxification process that happens where we clean out unwanted cellular material. We, uh, we get rid of uh, damaged uh, cells. Uh, apoptosis is related. That's the program death of dysfunctional cells before they become cancerous. Let me so chime in and ask you this. Okay, so there's some cells and stuff. They need to die. They're old, crappy, and we need to get them out. Um, are you saying that if we're constantly eating and we're never in a fasted state, it never has the chance? Right. We're either um, repairing cells and being efficient, or we're dividing cells at an accelerated rate. And the accelerated cell division occurs when you overfeed yourself. And, at and that's where points, Jason Fung was talking about with cancer and other things and the studies on caloric restriction, or I guess you probably meant fasted state, um, was exactly that too that whole point about like being able to do the turnover or he was saying at a certain age you don't want to be in growth mode right you don't want to <laughs> at a certain age yeah it's called 18 now so <laughs> right right but, right right but, right, um, right you know you mentioned there are times in life when accelerated cell division is optimal that's what we want and that is uh pregnancy uh nursing right uh, growing until we're reached full growth. And especially the kid trying to, uh, I should, I don't, I don't recommend playing high school football. So let's say the kid trying to make the high school basketball team, uh, trying to add muscle and that's great. So that kid needs to go home. One of them is named uh, Jack, my son. And this guy eats nonstop all day long because he is a natural skinny guy, but he wants to carry 195 pounds on his frame so he can be muscled up for basketball and everything else. So he lifts weights and eats and that's basically his life. Uh, enjoy your youth, I said maybe once or twice, because <laughs> if you try doing that 10 years down the line, um, the muscle's going to probably turn more likely into fat. So for the rest of us or most of us listening, um, this, you know, this accelerated cell division is undesirable and can lead to all kinds of problems, especially what about, cancer. What about, what about like example right now, me? Um, I'm working more on like building muscle, doing more weight training. Cause I was such a, I'm such an endurance person and I love that shit, but it's really not my jam for results anyway. It's just, <laughs> I love it. So, um, you know, I've been doing that and, but you're not saying no, don't grow and build your muscles. You're just saying at a certain point though, if you go crazy with it, it's a problem. Yeah. We're talking about overfeeding. Right. And that's a, that's a state of inflammation anyway, even if it's healthy yeah. foods, that's what I learned. Overeating is inflammatory, which I guess what Jason Fung was going to with the caloric restriction and cancer and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I, I appreciate it. a couple of times you've, you've stopped us and made sure that we're not talking in a, in a black and white manner because everything's nuanced, right? We want to eat enough food to recover from our strength training sessions and build and maintain muscle. Rob Wolf gave me an awesome soundbite uh, during a recent interview. And he said, hey, look, if you want to live longer, lift more weights and eat more protein rather than go crazy with extra fasting and you want to get your silver badge. And so you're fasting again and fasting some more. And guess what? I mean, at my age, I'm in my fifties now, I'm really focused on peak performance, enjoying my fitness goals, even at this age, uh, maintaining lean muscle mass. And so uh, I have less uh, you know, rationale to go into an extreme devotion to fasting, because guess what? You talk about autophagy and all those great benefits of being in a fasted state. The same thing happens when you do a hard workout. You're sending the same signals to your genes. You're starving your cells of energy because you're burning them up during the workout, right? And so you're getting kind of a fasting experience through a, a, a properly conducted 20 minute high intensity session at the gym. And so I personally have, I think, erred in the past of trying to load up on all these cool things like maintain these sprint workouts, even as I'm an old guy trying to, you know, compete <laughs> and do things that, that I did in high school and try to fast and try to maintain this uh, devotion to the ketogenic macros and not eat over 50 grams of carbohydrates per day. So it depends, you know, uh, the listener needs to figure out where they're at on the spectrum of their goals, uh, their relative importance of longevity versus peak performance and all these kind of things we have to weigh into the picture. But for most people who are carrying excess body fat, that's a good sign that we need to look toward, uh, you know, uh, metabolic optimization, metabolic efficiency through not eating so frequently. And that's the, the main point of this book. That's why the, the, the cover and, and the title is like, look, you, you can make good food choices and eat too frequently and eat too many calories because you're snacking all day long and kind of grazing and doing all these things that we are actually told to be healthy. So uh, eating less frequently 
and then making the good meal choices. That's going to be your winning formula with diet. Uh, but I know we have you know some little time left here to talk about all the other lifestyle things that are basically they're going to make or break your diet efforts. And so if you have a high stress lifestyle and you're cutting calories, especially carbs, and we have a whole section of the book um, that the, the subtitle is uh, the subsection is called "Liquidating Your Assets." That's a quote from Dr. Tommy Wood, one of the most brilliant minds in the whole ancestral scene. And he says, if you are not well prepared to do your fasting and do your hard workouts or whatever it is that you're jumping into with great enthusiasm, you're going to liquidate your assets to get the job done. And what he means by that, especially in terms of the stress response, is if you're not good at fasting, you're not prepared and you're not good at burning body fat, and then you go skipping meals, you might feel okay for a while because you've activated the fight or flight response. You get a surge of cortisol, the prominent stress hormone in the bloodstream, and you catabolize lean muscle tissue into glucose so that your brain is alert and energized all day long, even though you haven't eaten. But you're not burning fat, you're burning sugar because you're still in these sugar burning patterns from all the other uh, checkpoints that you have against you with this high stress lifestyle of doing too much exercise. I mean, go go read Paleothyroid Solution, the first through first few chapters that were so uh, you know heartbreaking to, to listen to what you were doing l because you were you were doing what everyone said working out so much recommended working out like crazy a uh, workout machine and of course not eating those nasty sugars or anything that's you know uh, going to be off the diet plan but the overly stressful workout patterns uh, were extremely destructive to your health and i think a lot of people are out there in when the people same boat just keep pushing it they still keep they still people are still pushing that chronic cardio and they're still pushing these, uh, even when they're exhausted and tired, and you just have to listen to yourself. Also, too, like, I just still don't understand why people aren't prioritizing sleep. Yeah, that's we funny. Talk about it all, we talk about it all the time, but it's like, I don't get it. I talk to people, and they're like, I'm so tired, I'm so tired. I'm like, what time do you go to bed? They're like, 12, what time do you wake up? Five. I'm like, what, what do you, that's on you, man. That's on you. I don't know. It's almost like an adult being chronically late is a crazy pet peeve of mine, because I'm like, <laughs> Sorry. at what point have I, when have I, <laughs> No, yeah. no, but I'm just like, when have you not learned freaking time management? People? Yeah. Like, it's not yeah. like you, so at some point you have to look at the phone and go, I need to put everything down and start to think about going to bed. I mean, you have to make it a priority. I think one of the best anti-agers, at least for me, and I, I, I feel like it's helped me throughout these years is that I, I sleep eight, nine hours a night, almost every single night. It's very rare when I don't. And if I do it, I'm off. Like, I don't like it when I get a get low sleep and as we know like our brains need the time to clean out the synovial fluid like this is legit for every level of health so sleep is really important the over exercise and the chronic cardio is crazy what else uh lifestyle wise well speaking of sleep and this uh, exasperation that we all know better right but these Netflix series are so compelling and it says the next episode will start in five, <laughs> four, three, two. And I'm, I'm like, I honestly jump for that remote before that thing can click into the next show because oh, I know it's 100%. gonna it's gonna lure me in. So I think that discipline is uh, really necessary. And on the topic of sleep, I also like to add in uh, rest, recovery and downtime. So it's sleep, rest, recovery, and downtime. We need that night to sleep. We all know that. We should put on our blue blocking lenses from raw optics when it turns 9 p.m. and we should do this and we should do that at nighttime. But also, uh, and you know, we're of a, a, you're much younger than me, but we're still in those generations where we have a memory of what life was like before the mobile device. And I, I would say, what days. is it? Maybe half of my life or some number like that. There was no mobile device. There was no computer. There was no internet. And so we had this thing called downtime where the brain was actually able to relax and chill and maybe have a slow moving conversation between two or three people, or you're just uh, whatever, reading the newspaper and looking at the box score of the baseball game and processing way less information than we're compelled to now. And so I think for the first time in the history of humanity, we have this requirement for downtime for the human brain that requires extreme discipline and focus to just put that finger on the, uh, on the power down button and have periods of time where we walk away. And that's like one of the best things about my morning routine is that first 35 minutes of the day, I'm actually 
it's I, I would call it a form of meditation because sure. I, I have to count through all my sequences, right? So I do a 40 hamstring kickouts, I do 20 frogs in each direction, then I do 15 leg swings. And so I'm counting, counting the whole time. And I can't think of anything else because I'll lose count. So that's my rule. If I lose count, I have to start over. It's a huge penalty. I don't want to do that because I remember a couple of times I'd have a podcast going. And so I'd play the podcast on the side and then I'd lose track of my count. And so this becomes a total meditative experience where I'm just focused on the physical movement. And that's how I start my day. And so ideally, the dream here is that I will leverage that focus and discipline that I build. Same with jumping in the cold plunge, which is uh, also part of my morning regimen. But if I can do these things and have them in place, then I might be a little bit better at reaching for the button and stopping the uh, the sequencing of the uh, binge watching at night and go to sleep or, you know, stay away from my email inbox when I'm supposed to be writing a book. But it's a, it's a constant battle and it's really tough. And I like to highlight that as one of our big to-do lists right now. Um, on that note too, you, you got to enjoy your own company. Part of that means you're just sitting there, you're just sitting there staring in the face with your own thoughts. A lot of people, yeah. I, by the way, I do a lot of that. Like I, yeah. I do, I, I enjoy that. I like yeah. downtime, silence, staring at a wall, just staring out the window at a mountain, just thinking about something. I, and I feel like that's good because you know, when, when I used to work, uh, tutor some kids many years ago, this modern families had everyone busy, uh, schedule up, mm. everyone was going from violin to this, that, and these kids had no time to just like go make a freaking fort in their closet or a uh, pretend office or, and so I remember they would come to me and they'd be like, we're bored. And I'd be like, what? And they were like gajillionaires <laughs> with a huge house and a trampoline. And I'm like, oh my God, we would never have been bored as kids. Like, cause we didn't have anything else. So we'd be like, well, let's make some shiz up in the back room. Let's pretend we're on a spaceship. Um, and so I just love that because downtime invites creativity and it invites mm these things in if you're not allowing for any of that invitation then you're just a stimulated person then all you're doing is just being stimulated by the outside world and i wish more people would get on up in there in their brains and just um yeah go back to sort of how it used to be when you know you're bored on a weekend and there's nothing to do and the parents are like whatever fine figure it out uh -huh. you know instead of turning to something so i think that's really important and i think that goes into your and mark's uh consistent theme of play which comes from just like yourself, right? Yeah, very well said. And especially shout out to the younger generations that didn't have the, uh, they, they have only the experience that they've lived through, which has been the digital age. And it's, it's right. heartbreaking to me. And I'm, yeah. you know, I've told my kids since they were little, like, here's a couple battles I'm going to be fighting with you. One is the junk food of the planet and the manipulative marketing behind it. Yes. And I want you to know that these guys don't care about your health, you know, and number two is your screen time. And so I was a pain in the butt on those levels. Hopefully on all the other stuff, I was the, I was the softy dad. Remember that show Modern Family where mm -hmm. the guy's introduced on the first show and he goes, yeah, I'm what's known as the cool dad. <laughs> <laughs> that was his intro to the audience. And so I'm kind of the cool dad. I, I probably should have been more. You're the Phil uh, Dumpy you know. of the. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, right, right, right. Uh, but I did I did fight the battle on a couple fronts and I, I picked my battles carefully. But I think, yeah, for the young kids, oh my goodness. Yeah, get those devices out of their hands and see what see where their brain takes them. That's right. Yeah, I never know you're coming up. So uh, two meals a day on Amazon, everywhere books are sold. Any also tell us what's the YouTube video uh, with your morning routine? Oh, you can look for Brad Kern's morning routine. And in fact, you'll find two, which is really interesting because the first one that Brian filmed uh, four years ago, that was when I first started this thing. Remember that. And it was like 12 minutes long. It was done in bed because I said, I want to do it in bed so that I, I won't get distracted. And I realized if you do any core work in bed, it's so freaking easy compared That's to right, the ground. <laughs> so I finally, I finally one day got out of bed and was like, oh my God, my stomach's burning after the first couple of things. Uh, but then there's the 2020 version and it's really cute. There's a fast motion. You can see the whole thing in like one minute if you're, if you're, uh, if you're on a fast pace. And then I explain everything in detail after. And this is just my own personal creation. But for anybody, and I'm echoing words of the great uh, brain scientists like John Asaraf and others that I've studied. Um, we want to set goals that are really easy and doable and achievable and we give us them. confidence. We don't want to overwhelm ourselves. Like, here we go. Brad and Elle just finished another podcast and they told me 17 cool things. I took notes and here it is. That's too much. And so if you can just take a little bite-sized thing away from, uh, away from our show in this example and to do something in the morning that's empowering and good for your body and physical 
ideally getting outdoors into fresh air and getting your eyeballs exposed to uh, direct sunlight. It doesn't have to be a sunny day, but just getting those eyeballs, uh, you know, sending that message that light is on the eyeball that starts you out for a good night's sleep first thing in the morning. That's the first trigger for the hormones, serotonin to rise, adenosine to drop, uh, cortisol to rise. All these things happen as soon as we uh, expose ourselves to sun. And then uh, hours later, that'll help prompt melatonin release at night. So we actually do get sleepy and go to bed instead of be running around at midnight looking for ice cream and another Netflix series. So uh, start doing something for yourself. And if it's only five minutes that you have to spare during your busy morning, and a lot of people will admit that's all they have, that's great. Make it five minutes. If you happen to own a dog, I think it's your obligation to the animal that you got to get that dog outdoors for a morning walk. Yeah. And so honor something bigger than yourself if it happens to be your dog, but do something where you're not a victim of all the stimulation that we have and the things that can distract us and take us offline. I love it. It's almost like getting back to primal basics in almost every way really is what we're kind of advocating. <laughs> it's of... pretty simple, people. <laughs> pretty simple, yeah. yeah, it doesn't cost anything. No, nothing we mentioned costs too much money, right? Fasting doesn't cost too much money. Uh, avoiding those crazy extreme Sleeping cardio workouts. Is expensive. No, I'm huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, thank you so much. There's so much to talk about. You know, I want to have you back on again because I, I, I feel like I got a whole Q&A list of things that I want to ask you. Uh, that I know yeah, we should take our um, listener Q and A. We'll tackle yeah. it together. That'd be That's cool. Good. So, um, you know, weigh in, people. Uh, we usually, I don't know what email address you communicate, but um, we have a bunch of emails that we can that can reach us. Info at primalblueprintpublishing.com, I think. Yeah, or anyone can contact me through lrust.com. Contact. Oh yeah, me. sure. You can throw, yeah, throw us your questions, or if you have any questions for for Brad, particularly if you have for me, that's cool too. But I, um, I focus it more towards Brad. Maybe we can get Mark on it too, or something. Um, Again, Brad's macadamia masterpiece <laughs> nut butter is so amazing. Check it out on Amazon or Brad. She's my pitch girl. You're hired. <laughs> you can also go yeah. to bradkearns.com. Uh, he's got the, you got your own podcast where you interview people called the B Rad Podcast. For Brad, Including L Russ, one of our favorite shows, most downloaded ever shows. Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, and yeah. And then also for everyone else who wants to know anything about paleo primal, go to primalblueprint.com or marksdailyapple.com. There are like, hey, week free meal plan. There are so, what's this fat adapted mean? Type it in. Going to be a ton of articles that come up. How do I read a lipid panel? It's all there. Mark's Daily Apple is one of the top health blogs in the country has been for many years and you can find so much information uh, on some things that you might still want more clarity on in this conversation. Brad, thank you so much for coming back on, brother. Good show, Elle. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure. All right, everyone. We'll see you next week.